Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to a digital discussion. Big thank you especially to Carol Maver and Emma Wilson for joining us tonight. This event is to, to celebrate the publication of a magpie and an envelope, which Duxa published earlier this year has the third essay in our Thoughts One Can Do Without series. Thoughts One Can Do Without invites authors to share the thoughts that anchor, shape, and guide their lives, whether it's a one-time epiphany or a close-held mantra, or as in Carol Maver's case, something altogether more intimate and harder to articulate, the thoughts of her parents. The resulting book, A Magpie and an Envelope, is one that we are incredibly proud of. It is a contemplative and lyrical memoir infused with art and literature. In writing about her early memories, Carol confronts the bruising power of love and loss through the image avatar of an avaricious magpie. I now have the great pleasure of introducing Carol Maver and Emma Wilson. Carol Maver is a writer who takes creative risks in form, both literary and experimental, and political risks in content, including sexuality, race in America, child loving, and the maternal. Her reading Boishley, Roland Barr, J.M. Barry, Jacques-Henri D'Artigue, Marcel Proust, and D.W. Winnicott was named by Grayson Perry in The Observer as his 2008 Book of the Year. Maver's Blue Mythologies, A Study of Color, coaxes us into having a less complacent attitude, even when it comes to something as apparently innocuous as a color. Carol Maver is Professor of, of Art History and Visual Culture at the University of Manchester. Other books include Aurelia, Art and Literature Through the Mouth of the Fairy Tale, and Black and White, The Bruising Passion of Camera Lucida, La Jete, Sans Soleil, and Hiroshima Mon Amour. Emma Wilson is professor of French literature and the visual arts and lecturer in modern and medieval languages at Corpus Christi, Cambridge. She's author of Sexuality and the Reading Encounter, French Cinema Since 1950, Memory and Survival, the French cinema of Christophe Kieslowski, Cinema's Missing Children, Alain René, Atom Egoyan, Love, Mortality and the Moving Image, and The Reclining Nude. She's currently writing a book on the films of Céline Siamma. We're going to start by screening two short films by Carol Maver. After a discussion, there will be a Q&A, so please feel free to write your questions into the little box. All attendees get 15% off the thought series. The discount code is in the chat box and we'll email it to you afterwards as well. But at this point, before we look at the films, um, I just wanted to say how, how thrilled I am to be part of this event. Um, I first encountered Magpie Daddy at a reading Carol gave in Kettle's Yard in Cambridge. Um, it's a joy to see her memoir work pursued in a magpie and an envelope, and I'm holding it up here um, for Juxta Press. The small volume, I think, is, is hugely precious. It feels like a, a pocketbook you want to carry around with you. Um, it's accompanied and preempted for me by a memory of Carol's voice reading her own words. And for this reason, I want to say that I'm so happy that we're starting with two recordings, short films of Carol reading um, that I think we're now going to play. Just let me say thank you to everyone, to Emma and everyone at Juxta Press. It's a very happy occasion for me. Thank you. Magpie Daddy. Where does the past go? Can you steal it like a magpie? Like all magpies, I am a kleptomaniac. I steal, I steal, I steal. I steal words, I steal things, I steal lives. Sometimes I let myself be stolen, especially with you, father. You are the burglar under my bed, a daddy magpie in hiding. I see you everywhere. Let's keep it that way. 
I spot you on the roof of Piero's The Nativity. You are discreetly turned in silent profile, far less magpie-ish than the singing donkey who is braying in the background behind the lute-playing angel dressed so handsomely in chalk blue. He, uh -huh, e or daddy, you have always been polite. I see you on a little wooden gate made of crooked bird leg sticks and Monet's snowscape entitled The Magpie. Your white feathers are cast in ice blue like the shadows in the snow. I cannot hear you, but I hear the freezing blue of you. You always love the snow. You taught me to ski when I was but three years old. You were on a leash in Goya's Red Boy. You loved red. You hold the artist's calling card in your beak. Your nose is so handsome and striking. You gave me your nose, but it looks better on you. The boy in the painting will die young. The calling card turns funerary. Magpies are known for their funerals. Upon discovering a dead magpie, a magpie will begin its notorious loud chatter, beckoning other magpies to join in with the grieving. As many as 40 might join the ceremony. Magpies have been observed burying their dead under twigs of grass. After 10 to 15 minutes of magpiety, that's a real word, they fly off in silence. Note, one note from one bird is better than a million word. A scabbard has but one sword. How can one bird, one word mean so many things? How can father, my father, be everything? Magpie daddy, my note, my bird, my sword, my word is dad. A little patch of yellow dead, but dead forever. In Time Regained, the last volume of Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time, the character Burgot famously goes to an art exhibition to see the little patch of yellow in Vermeer's view of Delft. Upon seeing it, Burgot collapses and dies. Marcel, the author, narrator, character in this long as life novel, ponders the loss of Burgot, commenting, dead, dead forever? Perhaps my father, he too, is in that little patch of yellow that Bargat saw before he shut his eyes forever. The yellow markings that only California magpies have around their eyes and color their beaks like solid yellow candy corn candies are little patches of Proustian yellow which reach me via Proust in search of lost time. Exit wounds between inside and outside my father and I, the past and the present, like a healing bruise turning yellow. A flash of me as a child, slipping my fingers into the mouth of a yellow snapdragon flower in our backyard in California. Daddy, you planted them with your seeds. Watching them sprout, grow, and blossom was nothing short of magic, magi, magpie. Many say that the little patch of yellow does not exist in Vermeer's view of Delft. Perhaps you only see it with your eyes closed. When the lamps in the house are turned out, after your death, I wear your cranberry red sweater as often as I can. I keep your phone on just in case the call comes in. I use your wine glasses with the yellow gold trim. I see your wedding ring on my son's finger. I pilfered it for him. I steal, I steal, I steal. Sometimes I find the yellow. Hello, magpie daddy. Hello down there in the big black hole that you left behind. Hello, toots, says you, a whisper. I feel your squeeze on my knee, finally, again. I feel, I feel, I feel.
I made my mother sick. I am inside you. Mother, I make you sick and we haven't even met yet. My effect on you is pernicious. Initially, I was just an irking blossom, but soon a cherry with a pit, then a plum, green and unripened, then a pomegranate, its blood juice sour, its seed woody, then a mango with a sweet resinous smell, which was unfamiliar to you, which you did not like, then a cantaloupe, you did love the sweetness of this fruit and its color, but the smell was squash-like spoiling. Then a honeydew melon, and you felt the weight too much. Now a pumpkin, unimaginably too big. I am inside you. Your camellia heart calmly pedals its beat. My hummingbird heart taps an extremely bright allegro, precisely 160 beats per minute. Your puffer frog lungs suck in air that you exhale like a gust of wind outside of my tight digs, making me feel safe and contained like home on a stormy day. I am not using my lungs yet. That is to come. A trickle of our shared blood makes its way through my umbilical vein to my staccato heart. Your bones make faint branch cracking sounds. My bones are silent and soft like green sounds. I hear the doctor's mourning dove voice, his worried voice. I hear the mosquito buzz of surgery lights. I hear a cacophony of calculating voices planning on how to get me out. I do not understand. I am not mentally clairaudient. I naively the cesarean section is ready to begin. As if erasing the week's vocabulary words on the classroom chalkboard, the anesthesiologist quickly erases you clean with darkness. You smell the nauseating odor of clean seafoam green hospital mint sleeping gas. I do not smell it, but I will later when I am six and I have my tonsils taken out. Hearing the blade of the surgeon's knife as deafening in my closed quarters. I am being pulled from my dark cave, my burrow, my den, my hole, out into the light of the world, Persephone in reverse. I am being pulled and pulled from the darkness of my cupboard, where words are heard but not understood. And Toes, fingers, bottom, skinny, knees, tiny vagina, bloated belly come out of the carefully cut baby size slit. The smell of blood, sweet like dark raspberries to my untrained nose of innocence. My mouth opens, clean as a cat's, soon to develop a milky coat from the baby formula you will feed me, but not yet. Like a spider cut from its own string, the umbilical cord is cut. We are cut in two. I try to sort out a song. I bellow a handful of notes. My first Winnicottian transitional phenomena. I cannot comprehend my reality, nor accept it. To disconnect from you is impossible. I take off that song. Sound is my first toy. Later will come my thumb, then the pink satin ribbon of my baby blanket, then a soft tiger toy, then a piece of string, then dance, then doll, then crayon, scissors, paper, then writing, writing, writing.
Well, I think I've described this this project as as perhaps the most overwhelming and loveliest piece of writing that that you've done, Carol. Um, it's it's a joy to talk about it with you. I guess I wanted to ask just um, at the start how you feel about publishing with Juxta Press and in this beautiful short format. And, and I'm, in, I'm interested in what opportunities it offered you um, for this project. Well, I was very happy uh, to be contacted by Juxta Press. Uh, they do such lovely books and they had been interested in an earlier book of mine, Black and Blue. Mm -hmm. And I found it to be liberating to have this smaller topic um, and to even think about holding it in your hands and the nice paper and the, and the beautiful ink. Um, but also, um, I really agree with the French philosopher Roland Barthes that a, a text on pleasure has to be short, like his very famous book of pleasure of the text. And I wanted to write uh, initially about the loss of my father, but I wanted it to be not as dark as my book, Black and Blue. I wanted it to have that kind of joy. So I think the small format afforded the joy that I wanted to talk about in terms of loss. And um, also to be more poetic and indulge in Sylvia Plath and Emily Dickinson and all these people that I'm, I'm stealing from. And, and I want to add, I was originally only going to write about my father, the magpie, and it was too short. This has never been said to me before, but too short. Um, and I knew I really had to write about my mother, which was a different sort of text where I also wanted to find that joy um, uh, in my mother and my memories of her, even though I really truly believe she was depressed most of her life. And I feel that I didn't personally bring on the depression, but I think the particular time of the 1960s and she had postpartum depression, which was not recognized in poverty. So they end up mirroring each other in, in a really, I think, hopefully interesting way. And um, discovering this envelope of writing that you don't hear in the little clip that my mother left I realized how smart she was and what a good writer she was in this short bit of writing. So I was really uh, appreciate Juxta Press for saying, you got to have something more. And, and what was missing, of course, was the mother. <laughs> I mean, that seems so extraordinary that that formal request to, to have something longer and then that possibility to juxtapose um, mother and father. And, yes, and, and yes. It, if it's longer, it has yeah. to be, it has to be, who's the mother here? So, <laughs> not like me to live, I mean, leave the mother out. I'm obsessed with the mother, but anyways, that was a good I, suggestion. <laughs> but I love, I love that response to a bit to, um, to, to, to fill, fill out the text in that way. Yeah. But I guess, I mean, at least, um, I suppose to to one of the, the bigger questions that I want to ask you and um you have such an amazing reputation as an art historian and 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 always I mean we we admire you so much your your readers as as an art historian who has brought in affect and and feeling and and to to explore that response I mean the delicacy of particular responses to art um I'm interested in in what's motivated the move towards memoir now and I, f I feel in some ways you've you've crossed an invisible line in your writing and the memoir mm -hmm. and and fiction seem I, I mean with your your wonderful life um like like a lake and and uh -huh. just, um I, I'm interested in in um where your writing is now and okay. um, yeah. yeah well just to give a little back background about my education a very long, long time ago, I started off um, making art and making large stage, stage 
sets and they were about color and childhood and a lot of things that we find in a magpie on an envelope. Um, uh, so that I was a kind of creative work that maybe would be closer to fiction. And I felt I became very interested in critical theory and I wanted to write uh, academically and take take a turn. So so I did um, my PhD, but I think that that emotion was was always there from the beginning. In fact, I used to really get in trouble from it. I sort of long for the art <laughs> the old days when academics would get mad at me and shake their finger. <laughs> you can't use I, you can't write about yourself, you know, you have to be objective. So I think that that emotion and that tendency towards art writing or fiction was always there. And interestingly, I was always writing about the mother, even though I almost didn't hear. Um, and I want to quote this wonderful quote from uh, the artist Mary Kelly, who's done such amazing work on motherhood, of course, with her postpartum document, that the mother is there, she's just too close to see. And if we if we think of the mother as that emotion, I, I think that, that that's there. Um, but I really wanted to write a novel. I, I'm so that is this newer book called Like like a like a lake um so it's it, and again i'm always going to talk about roland bart i'm i'm i like writing between two separate voices um and i'm going to quote now victor bergen who is also a wonderful photographer as well as the theorist who's published with juxta press that um, I want to be both the policeman of signs and getting things right and accurate, but I also want to be the professor of desire. These <laughs> two, two names that uh, are two voices that Victor Bergen um, gives to Roland Bart when talking about his book, Camera Lucina. So, uh, but I'm enjoying the fiction. And of, of course, you know, it takes just as much research. It's just, it's, yeah. it's not so different. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so different yeah. and the and the images are as important in that sense but but I, I love your your reference to Bart because of course he himself wanted to write a novel and 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 the, the, there's a sense for readers of Bart of, of the missing novel that never appeared at the end of his life and it's, it's right. wonderful that in the middle of your life you're you're moving between these different modes in, yeah. in such a, yes. a yeah. creative way well, I feel, I guess maybe that's almost like a little patch of yellow that I'm driven towards is that unwritten novel that, that Bar Ega, I guess he just left a few words, you know, on his, on his uh, uh, typewriter, but uh, moving towards um, that kind of fiction. But of course, the emotive was there even in his very earliest books. Yeah, so. Absolutely. And, and the series um, that you're writing for it is entitled Thoughts One Can't Do Without. And I just wanted to ask you a bit more about how you thought about that series and title as, as you were thinking about this, this project and, um, and, and what it meant to you to write in a series called Thoughts One Can't Do Without. It was, it was, it sort of tr played tricks on me, like thoughts one can't do w without. It sounds very Proustian, yet at the same time, it sounds the opposite of Proust. So I, I, I thought about that for a long time. And I think that it's our parents, whether we know them, we don't know them, we love them, we hate them, we're indifferent to them. It, it, we want to know. <laughs> we want to know about them and think about them. So I think it's thoughts about my parents that I can't do without in the sense that um, I can't forget them. And so that's another kind of thought you can't do without. And I'm uh, really influenced by this beautiful little piece by Umberto Eco that says there's no art of forgetting. You can't make yourself forget. And I think the parents, as I said, even if we don't know them are still somehow a part of our thoughts and our sense of being. Um, just like I, when I talk about remembering being inside my mother's womb, it's the same sort of thing. I really feel like I remember or that I have those 
thoughts and, and our parents occupy them um, as well, even if we're orphans or adults. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was so fascinated read, reading the work. Um, I, was, I, I suppose I was fascinated by what what you remember and and and, and what stories you're telling. And, <laughs> and 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 I love the ways in which there uh, there feels at, at certain moments a, a fairy tale or enchanted mode of of writing that is 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 about retelling a family romance or, or, or <laughs> telling origin stories differently and I was so taken with this I mean the the opening words I remember being inside my mother's womb and I mean it's such a spellbinding start it 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 um I suppose it, it, it feels as if it suspends disbelief from the start as if um all the memories are in some ways magical unreal hallucinatory but also from the very origin from 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 the start I I I'm, I'm, I guess I'm interested in that that place of the womb at the start of the yeah. of the mm -hmm. text and 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 how how that relates to what follows I mean some of the water imagery the imagery of immersion the the blueness of Lake Tahoe all the the globes and orbs and worlds in 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 mm -hmm. your work Mm -hmm. The sort of Russian nesting doll images <laughs> of, of the mother herself. Well, be, this idea of remembering being inside my mother's womb, I actually stole that from a little boy <laughs> who was, um, there was a class, I, I have three sons myself, and there was a class um, that uh, with, I, with my first son, uh, Oliver, that we attended before and after birth. And there was an older sibling um, of one of the babies that had been born. And this little boy said, I remember being inside my mother's womb. I remember hearing her bones crack. I mean, he just said this with such absolute certainty that it really, really stuck with me. And of course that goes, well, not of course, but for me that connects to uh, Julia Kristeva's work and the way in which she usurps the term semiotic, not to be the science of science, but this time both before and beyond language. So maybe we do remember being in the room, but we just are not, it's just before language and there's a different way um, of articulating that. And I, I, I love the writing of the novelist Javier Marias. <laughs> and he has, he has a, a wonderful line in one of his books, like, if you never say it, did it never happen? And, and another way of saying that might be, <laughs> if you say it, <laughs> did it, did it happen? Yes. And, yes. you know, I think, when you write fiction or, or memoir, I mean, it does get confusing what is truth and what is fiction. And I guess I'm interested in that. I'm, I'm interested in that. Uh, yeah, you, you made me think of a, um, a French memoir text, um, Georges Perec's um, W, uh -huh. Memories of Childhood, and the, and, the, yeah. and the statement in that, I have no memory of childhood. And, it, mm -hmm. I, and I, I'm interested in that. It, Sort of an erasure of memory, but in in your yes. your work almost as a, a surfeit of memory, and 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 you write so interestingly about that sense of childhood always being present, and I mean mm -hmm. again through through Bart, but yeah. um, but I, I I feel I feel sometimes in the text it feels as if you're you're telling us secrets, you're letting us um, <laughs> letting us know or feel a series of um emotions to see mm -hmm. a series of of experiences that um that that might have stayed stayed hidden and i'm i suppose yeah. i mean i'm i'm interested in um secrecy and and revelation just i suppose yeah. what the process of writing was like um well i hear i was I was really influenced by Michael and Holly, the, the well-known art historian's uh, work on um, art history as melancholic and this idea that we can't retrieve the past, that, you know, that we never really know the meaning of these objects. And she has this wonderful line, where does the past go? 
And I thought about that in writing both about my mother and father, that both this desire to hang on to the past. I, I don't know if I have such a desire to represent their past. Yeah. Um, that's probably a bad way to go. <laughs> but but just to sort of, um, well, to, to, to be in that place in in the press present in a kind of Proustian way, I think. And there, there are some involuntary memories, right? Do invoke that kind of involuntary memory where you suddenly remember the past yeah. in a flash. Um, maybe you're, you smell your grandmother's perfume and you suddenly have an image of your grandmother or... Um, I had one actually a couple of days ago. I haven't had one for a while. I was eating a very chilled banana. And I remembered that my mother used to freeze bananas and give them to me as a child. And I had this flash of, of really liking those. So, um, so, but that's, I like that idea of feeling the joy of the past in the present, but it doesn't feel so much like loss. So I don't know if that answers your yeah. question or, or not. But, uh, but I, I love, I mean, the sense of the, the joy. Of, I, I mean, I, I, I was so struck by how you were describing the text as a short text because it's a text about joy, and and I think there's something that is so so redemptive. It's, it's that it, it's giving that Proustian intensity of feeling as 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 different sensory experiences from mm -hmm. the past are are retrieved and and held in the writing and and held in the images that you're you're showing. It seems. Um, I, I think such a, a a process about about beauty, about joy, about about resurrection, and I I, I feel so much as well that um, like 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 Proust, who um, we've we've both been thinking about. There's a real sense that you're you're writing about so much more than your your own childhood, and writing about yeah. child childhood right writing about a particular era i mean i i, I love the the details of, of of particular particular moments of a particular um 20th century history that's that's caught at, at certain mm -hmm. moments but the, but then also a, a kind of a timeless sense of of childhood of childhood perception of childhood intensity and um particularly in relation to to color and taste and sense impressions i mean ex mm -hmm. extraordinary ev evocation of 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 taste of smell of 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 your mother's perfume of of the color of um of of of, of clothes of of places and 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 I guess a, um, a text that came to mind for me very much was was Virginia Woolf's *The Waves* and and the early moments where the the six characters are evoking six different sense impressions and the the I see a slab of pale yellow said C Susan I see a crimson tassel said said Ginny and um and I and I love the way that experimental modernism is working to um to see the way that children children see or, or, or to to imprint that in literary form but I, I, I was in, was interested in in how how your work is speaking to childhood more broadly and I guess I, I was thinking particularly about the experiences of of the only daughter the the girl in the house and the house with her parents I mean I as an only daughter I guess I'm um, maybe I'm projecting it but, but I feel that there's a certain intensity to this child in a house of Yes. But. yes, yes. Um, well, so 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 much uh, to say. I mean, first of all, um, you know my work very well, so of course the the Proustian uh, reference is there when I'm thinking about when he says uh, that he wants to provide for his readers and in search of lost time a magnifying glass in which to look at their own lives like the one in the optician's window and and that that's what that's what i want i want people to play with me and you know maybe they'll remember their 1990s childhood <laughs> through these kinds of specific memories but that's why i am at times very specific because i think that almost 
don't know if I want to call it photographic, but very, very specific, then helps you to remember, I think, something very a specific smell or texture or 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 image um, of your own. So I want to, it's not just about my childhood, but it's a way of writing. I'm always going to talk about Bart, but but writing mm -hmm. along a kind of writerly um, text in which the readers are writers with me. I mean, I was really struck by you talking about the waves. I feel like I've been found out because I was listening to um, an audio version of the waves uh, exactly. much of the time when I was uh, writing this. And I was, I'd never read the waves before. And um, I was just struck by the, the, the childhood memories that weren't childish, but were modernist, as you said, and so sophisticated and, and the use of color. And I was, ju I just thought, oh, it's all been done. It was it's <laughs> such an amazing text. And how did she get away with it at that time? You know, it just seemed so revolutionary. So uh, those flashes of color and then the sort of the rhythm of the waves as the rhythm of the riding and the pattern of the riding as well was was very influential. Yeah, well, I'm so happy to hear that. But, and also, I, was, I, I, I felt there were almost too many references from the waves that I could draw out in terms of the, I mean, I, I love um, the character Rhoda and her, and her image of the, the pool and, 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 and the swallow. And it just, it, it felt, yeah, I mean, I, I um, your your writing seems to to meet that that impulse mm -hmm. to, to find wow. to find something of of childhood. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the mother and the father. And uh, in the back of my mind, I'm I'm coming in also to I, I suppose to the lighthouse and the sense of these, uh -huh. these two archetypal figures there. But, um, in your text, you have Magpie Daddy. And then the second part is called Ice Blue Easter Lily Envelope Mother. Mm -hmm. And and the first time I read the text, it felt as if the two were quite distinct and with the two parents. And and, and I, I knew Magpie Daddy before from, from your reading in, mm -hmm. in Cambridge. But but going back to the text, I found the the um the two parts become more and more involved with one another as one as mm -hmm. one reads and as mm -hmm. as as image patterns return and and I suppose I was interested in whether you were writing them with relation to each other or whether you 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 focused on each individual parent each each loved one each each relation to you as as mm -hmm. as you I well I wrote as I in terms of the timeline, you know, magpie daddy first, and then and then I wrote the piece on the envelope. Of course, I was thinking about my mother the whole time I was writing magpie daddy because I couldn't have written a text like that about my mother because that that wasn't her, and uh, she was very closed, like something in an envelope and a mystery. And as far as their marriage, I mean, I always was baffled by their relationship as a, as a child. Um, my father was the maternal one who, mm -hmm. who read to me, who put me to bed, who played games with me. And my mother was often not well and, and distant. So I wanted to um, think more, more about that. But your question makes me think about my parents together. And I think they were almost like um, in really young children, really young children who play together like side by side, but they don't interact. <laughs> it's, it's a kind of play, but it's not with each other. And I think that's, that's how my parents were. They were, they were quite separate. They loved each other in their own particular way, but they were, were quite separate. And, and my mother was, was very depressed and that was difficult for my father. And it was difficult for her, most of all, and, and, and difficult for me. So interestingly not enough, it was when my, my mother died some time ago, but when my father died rather recently, he left for me this envelope of writing that mm -hmm. my mother had. And I mean, I know you know there was a recording that I've written about too that my mother left, but this envelope mm -hmm. of writing, it was and to think that she was writing that uh, when I was at home and it, it just 
opened up something to me that showed how strong she was and that she could be really articulate in ways that I, I wasn't aware of. And it, there's something about that writing that reflects um, her beauty um, before I was born that I obsess on in, um, in an envelope, you know, just the way she wore clothes and lipstick and she just was another being. And so that, that beauty that I loved to see from another time before me um, then somehow echoes with that art articulation, that very careful writing. It's almost like careful dressing. That who she was writing it for, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I love the way that you you also use the text to bring back some of her writing and to to cite her writing. And in the the type yeah. of citational practice, the kind of what you describe as a type of magpie um, mm -hmm. stealing and citing, that mm -hmm. that you're also use using her words and. Um, as, um, as you did also, I think, in your essay about Chantal Ackerman and mm -hmm. um, and and um, and and that, I guess I I I love the way that your texts are are so capacious and open to the words of others, and yet also mm -hmm. have their own their own style, their own um, delicacy, their way way of um, revering and holding. The, the words of others. Um, I, I, I just want to say one thing there. I, I like to think <laughs> about words like pictures. I don't know. So I like what you're saying that I just want to present my mother's words like, like an image that almost sits, like images work oftentimes in my books where I might not talk about them much or maybe, but they have a strength and a pull and you know why they're there, but I don't want to ruin it in a sense. <laughs> by describing what's happening. Um, and so her words operate like that for me as well. And that, and that you made me think so much about, about secrecy and, and again about thoughts one can't do without. And that's and that sense sometimes that one can encounter things in, in your work almost unconsciously not understanding quite quite their power, but then and then that possibility of going back to them or or, mm -hmm. or in, encountering them again. But but I, I wanted to ask you particularly about images and and your your use of images. And we, we've mm -hmm. seen the, the beautiful slideshow that you 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 used. Um, and I guess I, I found myself um curious thinking about your work about how the images are relating to the memoir and mm -hmm. and whether they are giving access to memory giving it a different form offering um a, a text of um a space for for reworking memory blocks mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. um where I, I'm, I'm interested that um that, that your work draws on on paintings not on um per personal images and documents, or if it does, uh -huh. it's drawings rather than photographs of your, your parents or your childhood. Uh -huh. Well, I think to have a photograph like of my mother would, like Bart and Cameron, it would ruin it, you know, it's better for you to imagine probably, <laughs> um, or to see my father's nose, just think <laughs> of the magpie. Uh, but images sit with me like text. I just don't really, I don't, I do separate them, of course, but I don't, I keep them in my notebooks and I, I come back to them. So um, Piero's Nativity is, a you know, it's, it's in the National Gallery in England and, and I've seen it so many times and it sits with me and the colors and I'm just interested in the Virgin because of Kristeva writing about it. It's just, it's with me all the time. And then I didn't know about the map until recently so then it jumps out at me and becomes something else so um I guess I sit with these images and then they they speak to me in, in, in different ways but they're images that that I love yeah. that's and and I I love the the presence of of Piero in the project and the ways in which you also write so beautifully about the um, the Madonna del Parto and the scene, particularly in in Tarkovsky's nostalgia 
and I, I, I guess it, it, it feels, I mean, you, you've written so much about, about maternity and mothers and, mm. and, and children and, and it, it's, it seemed, it seemed particularly apt and poignant in this text about your parents to return to a nativity mm -hmm. image and mm -hmm. yet to find in it something new to find, mm -hmm. to find the magpie, mm -hmm. the Tarkovsky sequence, the, the fluttering wings of the birds, that, the, the, the ways in which that connects so, so beautifully with the Emily Dickinson poem that you quote and, and hope, mm -hmm. hope having, having wings. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, well, thank you. I mean, there, the, again, those are images that that scene from Tarkovsky's Nostalgia when I saw it a million years ago. I just I've been waiting to write. Sometimes I'm waiting to write about something. So um, that's that that's where that uh, uh, came from. But I, even though I've written about the painting that is supposedly in the chapel, but not really there in the film um, before, um, but just this idea of the sort of parting of, of the belly or the opening of the belly. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. No, I, I, I love that sense of waiting to write about something and then <laughs> finding its place in a particular text. And um, I mean, the. I, I was I was very interested in the um, the reference also in the text to the Tina Madotti um, mm. photograph Easter Lily and Bud, um, where you write about your mother, the petals of the mother lily are mm -hmm. gently open, um, and and I mean, this leads back to what you were saying about about her beauty, but and and also about joy and a memoir and 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 within um, a. I suppose an, an honoring of a life or a recall of your mother that that must must also have have um, melancholy within it. But mm -hmm. but that um, that image of her beauty, yes. a sense of a sense of a, a daughter looking to an adult mother and seeing her her beauty and sensuality as some flowering of 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 the feminine that that mm. comes through so strongly. I was interested in in why Madotti for that, this, this image, Easter Lily and, and Bad. Okay. Well, I love Tina Padati's photographs and she, she has that very beautiful photograph, you might know it, of a woman holding um, a babe, a very chubby baby uh, on her hip. And I, 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 I think about that image a lot, but that is not the image of my mother and myself. We were like two, two separate flowers and just seeing that uh, blooming of her that reminded me so much of these gorgeous black and white photographs of her and my father, where she found this photograph, photographer, I don't know, he, she worked with him. Uh, and they're just absolutely gorgeous, square format, black and white uh photographs and it just it seemed to speak to that to that beauty of, of her um but I suppose I've been waiting to write about that Tina Matati <laughs> photograph for a long time uh too you know it, it was amazing seeing the, the two short films and the ways in which the sequence of the morning morning glory images the the flowers the um and oh. the, the um flowering and, and and then also they I mean the I, I think the the those blossoms only last for a day don't they and then they um oh you're thinking of the night blooming serious flowers which are yeah. different now the, the 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 morning glory are just more more common but I always use that image of that little film of that blossom opening in every lecture I give. <laughs> there's some it just seems to say so much this opening and this closing and that vi vibrant uh, I, it made me think back to the Tina Madotti, but also it, it felt it felt it within the sequence of still images that you used. It, it felt again mm -hmm. a moment um, like the birds in Piero, like like the mm -hmm. awakening in Chris Marker's La Jete. It's, it seemed that that moment of 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 moving towards film and something that is mm -hmm. is, is is living. So uh, that is a, a kind of sequence of of. Of living and dying that it, that that comes through so 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 intensely and so beautifully. Yeah, I think this idea of a kind of um, awakening, 
it, which is kind of is is the way in which um, Winnicott, who we haven't talked about, the famous British uh, child analyst, talks about the transitional object for the child as coming to life or a kind of awakening. And so um, it's very life affirming as you grow older and becomes quite spiritual as well. So I, I, what I'm looking for is an awakening. Uh, sounds cliche, but of, of my parents who are dead, but I don't want them to be dead forever. <laughs> like Bruce says about Bergot, that there's, it, it can't be, you know, I just say no. Yeah. I can't accept it. Uh, yeah. Even though my father would say, you have to accept it. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> there's there's a sense that the the text and its images and 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 the um I mean just the animation, the vividness that that is there in the writing and in that in that relation and in that in that pursued conversation and that pursued practice because I um I you you speak about um the sense of of, of your own work being being about about stealing about sighting I mean it, it feels as if you're 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 pursuing your your father's legacy in some ways mm -hmm. but making mm -hmm. it different making it making it new it's mm -hmm. yeah it's true T taking the stories that that he gave me and of course he taught me to read and I realized that this all this bedtime reading how important that was to me and giving me access uh, to language that I didn't think about more until later, but I really do remember very clearly learning to read and the pleasure I took in letters and text. Um, but it's, you know, as far as, and then I just use so many writers and I love their work so much and I do steal their words. So I'm always <laughs> confused about or want to give a kind of reverence to them, a kind of authorship to them, just like I want to give a kind of reverence um, to my parents' lives. And I think a lot about the work of uh, the literary theorist, Peter Staley Brass, who says, you know, just, it's okay. I'll, I'll we're always in the middle of things. You know, there's no beginning. You're always taking or stealing um, when you're writing. And, um, and I'm also really influenced by the uh, wonderful scholar who I know, you know, Alice Butler and her work yeah. on Kleptomania and Cookie yeah. Miller and Kathy Acker. So I could go on, on and on the sort of pleasure of stealing and, and, and giving back, but at the same time wanting to be polite. <laughs> And one of one lovely aspect of the of, of the book here is that when one encounters the words that are cited and they're they're marked out in the text so that one sees them as citations, but one one goes with them as something that is familiar but um but 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 may not immediately be recognized. Mm -hmm. And then at the back without without the conventional footnote but at the back there's a list of the of the references and citations which I, I, I think is a real um, gift to the reader that we read your text with the other quotations in oh, it but then I've, but then we we locate them at, at the end. I really like that you say that it's a gift because it, I work hard at getting all the citations right because I want people to know where those words are and for them to be able to find the exact page or when I can, I'll give it, you know, the original French and the translation if there's space for it, just so, you, so that there is a kind of reverence for the written word, just the way you ha have to cite a painting, where it's at and who did it in its dimensions. So um, I guess that's me being the policeman of signs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drawing to the close of what I want yes. to ask and we're going to open it up to to people I mean I guess I have one last I mean this is an indulgent question that I've saved to the end but but one thing that really stayed I mean I I, I I I guess a kind of punctum image something that really stayed with me um is is the image of lipstick in the in the <laughs> and and you have the um you you name the color of the lipstick that that she wore at your father's mm -hmm. um, memorial event I think and 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 it comes back like a charm and and, and like um, an expression of joy even in grief mm -hmm. and you say that you wore pink and cadmium red orange lipstick mm -hmm. and 
the cadmium red orange lipstick that, that <laughs> you, you detail I, I I love the gift that you give to to <laughs> your reader in that mm -hmm. moment but tell what 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 is in the color and and the names of colors and and oh. and the reds and the blues that, that that move through the work okay well i mean there's two things there the what's in that color i think that's the color of the lipstick that my mother wore before mm -hmm. i was born and she started wearing this borghese sort of paler pink you know it's it's this color of the time before me I love, I mean, I, we all, I think, love the names of, you know, interior paints for our houses or in, you know, lipstick colors that the name, it evokes something more um, than the color. It makes it quite literary. Um, again, to talk about Proust, how he likes, you know, riding the train and seeing the names of all the different stops and imagining what they might be. It's less important what they, maybe actually are as as what they could be. So that's why I li list the very specific colors to open up the possibility of imagination. Well, that <laughs> wonderful answer. I think at this point, I'm going to thank you for- um, Thank you, Emma. They were such nice questions and for wonderful. taking the time. Thank to you hear your much. answers. So now I think we're going to open up to um, the questions and um thank you so much carol and emma i mean i enjoyed this so much um it's been amazing so yeah i mean we we have a couple of questions uh, uh, i'll start with a question from sonia mm -hmm. who says uh, she was thrilled to hear carol read read her work uh, and she'd be interested to hear more about the resistant car the resistance carol says that exper she experienced to her writing style from academics, what resources help her stay true to her artistic writerly path? Uh, you mean like, I'm not sure exactly what Sonia means, but I, I do have memories of um, the second book that I published on, on Clementina Hayward and, and her very sensual um, and I think erotic photographs of her adolescent daughters, even though they were taken in South Kensington in the 1860s and 70s. So it was there where I talked about what I saw in the fabric or, or the touch as, as a viewer and sometimes um, some academics might get up and shake their finger at me and tell me that I can't do that. And I was very, very, very disturbed about it at the time. It really upset me. But, but then later I took some pleasure in it. And, yeah, and, and our history has actually changed a lot um, since those times as well. But I guess what I would say to Sonia is, I think you have to be very careful and I have you have to cite people and the work has to have an integrity, but don't write the way people think you should write. Okay. <laughs> uh, then we have another question. Um, so in the book, you include two of your own drawings. How does the drawing tie into your writing? And did you draw them while you were writing the book or before? I drew them when I was writing the book. Um, and it's something I'm experimenting with because I think there is a very interesting relationship between drawing and writing. Um, and this I get um, from another a PhD student of mine who, who uh, began a PhD called Drawing to Write and actually talked about people like Cy Twombly or Marcel Proust, how they moved, like in Proust's notebooks, he has little, or letters, he has drawings as, as well as um, text. So uh, I think there's something Drawing can feel like taking notes or getting closer to something, or if I'm copying um, an image, um, or looking at another image, it makes me, you know, that's how we learn to draw. It trains me to see as well. So. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess the, um, we don't have any other questions, so it's time to... <laughs> 
say thank I, you again for this wonderful evening. I really enjoyed it. And um, and please, I, uh, I, secret message. Can I ask <laughs> one, more, one more question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> just, just in case um, any, anyone needs a moment to, to think of a question. But, but Carol, um, one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you was, was, was where um, this, this book leads you in, in relation to your writing now. Um, uh, can you tell us a bit about your future project, projects? Oh, okay. Um, well, one thing that I, I'm always working, not because I'm so productive, or I, I'm always working on more than one book mm. at once. Um, and they influence each other. So I, I did just publish this novel called Like a Lake, which is part of a trilogy. The second one will be Like the Sea, where you'll hear Virginia Woolf in the waves again. <laughs> and the last one will be uh, Like a Tree. And they're all not about me, but they are about uh, Northern California in the 1960s and like Tahoe and redwood trees and things that are very familiar to, to my childhood. So, um, and there I use pictures and it is, and, and I do use facts in history. So again, it's this in, be, in between um, writing. So that's what I'm mostly um, focused on. And then I have another, um, idea for, um, or I've been keeping journal notes um, to write something about my husband, Kevin Parker. So um, we'll see where that goes. <laughs> I had a train journey with, with Carol between um, Cambridge and London and saw in, her making notes and an amazing notebook and just, just a sense of, of her as someone that is always responding thinking noting things down I'm I'm wondering if you you could tell us maybe maybe finally before we close but just just a, a little a little about that practice my my impression mm -hmm. is that some you're someone who is continually letting a, a project grow and and evolve and, and 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 you said that you're working on on several projects simultaneously um well, the notebooks really help me with that so that I don't um, forget ideas or I don't forget images or I will go to the museums and, and draw images that I see, which I find actually much more useful than trying to take pictures of them and things like that, like I used to do. So, and then I let the, the, the notebooks swell or build and then I go back to them. And it's like, I find all these secrets or these surprises that I suddenly remember, but I don't remember writing and it, sometimes I think there's something there that's really special that was written of the moment that I could never just do sit, sitting at my, my desk. Um, my teacher Paige Dubois, the wonderful classicist, told me you should always keep a notebook by your bed, you know, to record dreams or whatever you're thinking about. And I, I resisted that for a long time. But when I realized I could write anything in my notebook, I didn't have to write something smart or I didn't have to keep a journey of what I was doing. That was quite liberating. And I could cut and paste and make things and save things. So um, it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, drawing to write, I guess, writing to draw. <laughs> we have another question. Yes. Uh, Carol, can you talk about film or photography projects? Any percolating? Oh, well, yes. <laughs> I want to make a film. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have made a, one a film that, that's on my website, um, an artist film or a moving image project called Full about a young boy that has anorexia. But I really would like to really have a budget. And I, I, I think of my work in terms of film a lot and, and to, to make a film, I'd love to make a film about Like a Lake because the whole time I would think about how how that would look and, um, and, and maybe like a, art house film, <laughs> but not not a gallery film, like a, a, a real narrative. Um, but I'm really interested, as Emma has already pointed out, in a number of filmmakers like Chris Marker and uh, Chantel Ackerman. Um, so. Yeah, I see that many people here in the chat box are saying, um, please make a film, Carol. <laughs> 
okay, how are we gonna, who's gonna, who's gonna do that? <laughs> yeah. I, I would like to, I feel like that's what's waiting to happen. That's what, yeah, I would really like to do that. I was just thinking about that driving in the car today. So, uh, yes. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, well, thank you so much again, Carol. Thank, thank you so you. much. Emma. It's been amazing. And uh, I hope we'll be able to meet soon. And yes, that would be nice. And thank you for all the beautiful editing and encouragement and ideas. It was you were just a wonderful so press to work with. So nice, so nice. Such great typography, too. <laughs> okay thank you everyone thanks so thank much you. thank you bye-bye bye bye bye, -bye. bye.